This is lecture 12 and we're going to start talking about variable selection. So we've kind of cleaned up um, and finished off classification. Um, for now we're going to put a pin in that and we're going to go back to talking about regression and uh, more about model selection and how we can um, choose um, a good model or how we can select variables um, for a good regression model. So I want to begin today by talking for a, a bit of time about a really useful concept. And this concept is called the condition number. And the condition number is, well, it has a lot of very deep connections in um, kind of numerical analysis, statistics, and it's related to the stability of solving um, a linear system. Let's say when we talk about the condition number, um, let's specifically say of a matrix. And it is related to stability. That's not how you spell stability. Stability of solving a system. Let's call it um, A, Z is equal to B, right? So here is a, a classic linear algebra problem. I have a matrix B and uh, I have matrix A and we'll say A is some n by n matrix, for example. And I want to find solutions to my system AZ is equal to B. So I want to find Z. And this is what we talk about at the beginning of linear algebra for quite some time. And the question is, if I perturb B, if I change B, how does the solution to my system change? And that's related to what's called the condition number. So let's first talk about um, some related concepts to build up our, our intuition about condition number. Let's consider the question of what if I look at for a matrix, I look at the maximum value over any possible x um, of the norm of ax over x. So this is going to be basically the maximum amount that a stretches vector. So the first bit of this lecture is going to be a bunch of kind of linear algebra. But it's the maximum amount A stretches a vector, right? Because AX takes X, some vector, and it will push it into some other, other vector, AX, and it could stay stretch it by some certain amount, and it might change its direction, right? This is a linear transformation. And so if we look at AX over X, that kind of renormalizes AX um, in, uh, it renormalizes the size of X. So it's just the max amount anything, any vector is stretched. Um, and it doesn't depend on what the initial size is, we divide through by the initial size. So um, it's just, if it takes it, what, how does it multiply it, right? Because it's the length of AX over the length of X. We could call this, maybe we call this capital N. This is the maximum that, that we stretch any X. Notice that you could alternatively write this as the maximum value um, over just X's that are in unit, of unit length um, of the stretching. And the reason for this, why can we do that, recall that you know, X is just some number. And so the norm of AX over X, I can always bring a constant into my norm. So this we could write as the norm of AX over norm X. Norm X is just a number. I can bring it inside a norm. And this is if I maximize this over all possible x, this is this x here definitionally is x divided by its norm. Um, if we call this thing y, then the norm of y is 1. So equivalently, if you're maximizing over all x, 
norm of ax over over x, uh, or norm x, you could say I'm maximizing over just things with norm one. But equivalently, you know, it's the same way. Either you standardize the size of x by dividing through, or you standardize it by forcing me the unit vector. You can play a similar game, and you can call maybe little m to be the minimum value over all possible x that ax shrinks um, or stretches a vector. And equivalently, we could view this as um, just say, minimizing over all vectors with a unit norm um, in this way. But it's a similar kind of concept. This is the minimum, let's say, min amount A shrinks any vector. And notice here that if, um, let's say, if A, which is an n by n matrix, is singular, not invertible, then for some x, uh, we have ax is 0. That's kind of an equivalent definition of A being singular. So little m is 0 in that case. So if A is singular, little m is 0. And that's an if and only if condition. Um, let's say m is equal to 0 if and only if a is singular, A is not invertible. Okay, so we started off by saying we're going to talk about something called condition number, which is related to the stability of solving um, a, a linear system like that. So let's define, now that we've talked about this big M and this little m, um, let's define the condition number. And uh, our condition number typically is denoted with a kappa. Kappa of A is going to be big M over little m. And so notice here that, that kappa is basically is the max, match, max stretching of any vector by A over the minimum amount. Um, that A stretches any vector. And so it's basically the ratio of how differently does A stretch different vectors. It's the max amount you can stretch any vector by the minimum amount you can stretch. So it's kind of like how differently. You, you could imagine this in, say, the two-dimensional case. If you map how A stretches the unit circle, so here's my unit circle, under the action of A, it's going to, you know, A will deform this unit circle. If we take all the points on A and we send the, uh, all these points in this unit circle, and um, it doesn't have to be a unit circle, whatever circle, and you, you send them over to A times X, it's going to stretch this in some way. Maybe it stretches it like that. And um, this clearly sends some vectors... Uh, it's stretched one way, and kind of the minimum amount is the opposite, um, the opposite kind of uh, axis of this ellipse, right? So there's some vector that that is going to get just minimally stretched, and there's some that are going to be way stretched. So it's kind of stretching out this, this circle in some way. And the kind of the ratio of how much it stretches one dimension versus another dimension, um, and how different those are, kind of how, uh, what's the eccentricity of this ellipse is basically the condition number. It tells us how weirdly it, it squishes the space around. So what does it have to do with a linear system, right? Um, so this is our condition number, which is just the ratio of these things. Imagine, um, say, imagine that, again, we want to solve our linear system, az is equal to b. So we have some z, and az is equal to b. And... Um, we alternatively have some delta z and some delta b, where a by delta z is a by delta b. And you can imagine these to be small, it doesn't really matter. But the idea is that if we have that, then if we look at, um, if we originally want to solve the system 
AZ is equal to B, but I'm going to perturb B, I'm going to slightly alter it by some small amount, let's call it delta B. The question is, how much does my solution change? Well, it will change by delta Z. This is exactly equivalent if those two things are true. Then if I add together these two top equations, I'll get this bottom equation, so it's exactly true. So if I perturb by delta B, my solution will be changed by delta Z. Okay, so let's relate that back to condition number and eventually to fitting, fitting regression models. Um, and we may not get to the main punchline here, um, but we'll get, we'll get part of the way there and we'll start talking about variable selection today. Um, but I promise this is not a linear algebra class. We will talk about, um, about what, how this relates to fitting regression models. Okay, so, so I have this claim here. This is all good. That's pretty straightforward. If you go back up to my definition of M, of big M and of little m, notice that, um, and let's just write this kind of as an aside over here. Let's say by definition, um, for any x, if I look at how much uh, x is stretched by a, this has to be less than or equal to m by the size of x. And that's just definition of capital M. That's an equivalent way of defining it. And alternatively, if I look at AX, this has to always be greater than or equal to little m by, oops, by X, or something like that, right? Because M is the maximum, if I take the ratio of this, um, of norm AX over norm X, that's always less than or equal to M. By definition, M is the biggest value that I can take on. And equivalently, if I look at norm AX over norm X, it's always bigger than or equal to little m, because definitionally little m is the smallest value that I can take on. Okay, and so this is always true. And if we bring in our two equations here to this, we notice that a z. Um, so let me write this in terms of z. So norm of a z is less than or equal to m times size of z and norm of a z is oh it's bigger than or equal to little m times norm of z um, and this is also true if we replace z with let's say delta z Okay, and what's AZ? AZ is B, so B, which is AZ, um, I'm sorry, B is AZ, so norm of B is the norm of AZ, less than or equal to that, and A by delta Z, we called delta B, so the norm of AZ, delta Z is delta B. So that's cool. We can rearrange these, let's call this one and two, and one, if I um, move Z over and then move B over, let's say by one, I should say that one over the norm of Z is less than or equal to M over the norm of B. I think that's just a rearrangement of one. And by two, if I rearrange this in a clever way, um, if I look at norm of delta B, and I move my M over, divided by little m, is greater than or equal to, oops, this first one should be greater than or equal to, right? Because I, I do a flipperoo, right? I take one over these, one over um, Did I do that right? Let's, fin let's finish the second one first, right? So the second one says that um, if I move M over and I move this over, 
not mess this up, right? <clears throat> I move delta. Oops, I have delta b written there twice. That's no good. Um, what did I do wrong here? Nope. Delta b over m is written in equal 1 over delta z. All right. So this is 2. This is just a rearrangement of 2. Um, oops, that's in the top. That's why that's wrong. Okay. Let's see if I can write these inequalities correctly. Okay. This is clearly just a rearrangement of 2 here, right? All I've done is I've moved um, m over. Just moved m over. So delta b divided by m is bigger than the norm of delta z. Great. And for this one, I'm not sure, let's make sure I do this correctly. Um, if I move, if I invert it, then 1 over b is greater than or equal to 1 over m z, and I move m over, I will get this. So this is also just a rearrangement of this one. First, I flip the equation over, and then I move over um, m. So these two things are true, and if we multiply, what I get is that <clears throat> Greater than, greater than, I'm just going to multiply each side. Um, whoops. Yeah. What do we want to do here? I keep writing this one wrong, don't I? Does that look more correct? Yeah, I can just cross multiply. All right. Move z over, I move b over. That's easy. Okay, now I multiply. I don't know why I couldn't get that first one correct. Now I multiply. And um, so I multiply this side by this side. I get delta b over b. Finally, I get what I want. Times m over m, after rewriting it a couple times, is greater than or equal to, and I'm going to multiply these two sides. Greater than, greater than, right? And this will be delta z uh, over z. OK, so if you don't mess it up a couple of times, which is what I tend to do, um, this is the equality you get. And of course, we can, we can recognize some parts. This is called the condition number of A. And we can interpret this left hand as the relative change in b. So this is like how much am I changing b? How much am I perturbing b relative to its size? And equivalently, I don't forget my second bar here, we can interpret this side as the relative change in z. So if I perturb b by a relative change of this amount, the amount my solution, my z, is going to change is related to the condition number. So the interpretation is, is that relative change in b propagates kappa a times um, to change in z. So for each kind of unit, you know, relative change that I make in my B of my system, I'm going to get some multiple kappa change in Z. So this is how condition number relates to the stability of, as it is, is often said, of a linear system, where if I make some change in my system, I'm going to get a different solution. And how much a change or an error or a round off error is going to lead to a different solution, the kind of stability of my solution, is going to depend on the condition number.
notice that so if kappa of a is small then um, my system is we would say system is stable because relatively large changes in B propagate to small changes in my solution. So I can make big changes in B and I get kind of small changes in Z. And alternatively, if kappa A is large, then small changes, if I even slightly change my B, uh, let's say small changes to B, lead to large changes in my solution. Z, let's call it. Um, maybe Z is not the bad, best, uh, let's call it to the solution. So if I make even a slightly small change to part of my linear system, I'm going to get a wildly different solution. So we call that kind of an unstable system. If A is singular, uh, so not invertible, then the condition number is M over little m. But this little m is zero, and so the whole condition number is, say, positive infinity. Um, and uh, so we have an infinite condition number. So if our, our matrix is singular, in which case um, you know, if we're looking at trying to solve the system AZ is equal to B, it has an infinite condition number because I don't even need to change B to get potentially different solutions. There is no unique solution here because A is not invertible. There's multiple solutions. And so my condition number, my you know, problem is so ill-conditioned, as it's called, that I get kind of, I can get infinite changes in Z with no change in B. Say infinite change in Z, no change in B. So this is a, a useful concept condition number. You see it all over the place. And it tells me something about a linear system that I'm trying to solve. And it tells me about, um, about um, how much kind of, uh, how stable my solution is and how much uh, I expect my solution to change or be sensitive to slight changes in my, my, um, my matrices, my B, for example. So this is going to come back in a couple of minutes back to the problems we care about. And the changes in, say, B will be changes in, um, changes in the data, the small changes in the data. One more thing I want to point out here just to relate this all back to our favorite decomposition called the singular value decomposition. The reason I taught you the SVD, the first day of class, is because it's probably the most useful way of decomposing um, any kind of linear algebra. I would go to bat and argue that. And in this case, um, we can relate the condition number to the singular values. Um, so I just want to make a real quick note here before we do our little proof that if I have a matrix Q that is orthogonal, and we know kind of now what orthogonal means, then the norm of Q times X is just the norm of x. So orthogonal matrices are norm preserving is um, is what is said um, because multiplying by uh, a, a vector by q doesn't change its size. 
all it's doing is changing the basis in some way. It's basically rotating the basis of the space. Um, it doesn't actually um, it doesn't actually change, stretch, or squish the space in any ways. Um, it just rotates or roto inversion, so you can actually mirror the space too. So interpretation. And this is a super uh, useful interpretation is that orthogonal transformations um, rotate space, don't stretch. So um, we'll talk about that in a sec. The proof of this is that the norm of any vector, if I look at the norm of qx, let's say squared, that's just qx transpose qx. So we can use this definition of the norm squared of a vector. This is purely a vector. Qx transpose is x transpose q transpose. We multiply by qx. And definitionally for a orthogonal matrix or a property of an orthogonal matrix that's inverse is transpose, q transpose q is the identity matrix. And so this just gives us back x transpose x, which is, of course, the norm squared. So if I take the square to both sides, we have proof of the fact. Why do I bring that up? Let's go back to our, our m by n matrix A, and let's assume that it has the SVD, a singular value decomposition of UDB transpose. So the, what the SVD is de doing is it decomposes any matrix into a rotation of the space U, a purely stretching of the space D, and an, an, another rotation of the space V. Rotate column space, stretch, rotate to row space. So this is an aside, but the SVD decomposes any matrix into three really simpler operations. Roto invert the space, stretch the space, rotate the uh, roto invert the space again. And so it, you know, kind of orthogonal rotations of the space and stretchings of the space are really simple. It turns out any matrix you can view as three of these operations. Rotation, stretch, rotation. Um, yeah, so I'll leave it there. You can think of it for um, for the eigen decomposition, it's rotate, stretch, unrotate. But for a general matrix, um, you might have U and V might be different, and so there might be slightly different unrotations here. In any case, if we have A is UDV transpose, if we look at what we had defined as M before, um, and we said that we could write M as the maximum of over unit vectors x of a times x, the max amount it stretches any unit vector. And if a is udb transpose, this is udb transpose by x. And of course, if I multiply in a norm by any matrix Q, I can just ignore it as long as that matrix Q is orthogonal. And so if U is orthogonal, I can ignore it. So I'm just gonna ignore that U, it doesn't matter. It's orthogonal, it's not gonna change that norm. The rest of this is just some vector, we multiply it by U, ignore it. And this is also equivalent to ignoring, um, to ignoring uh, V because if V is our orthogonal matrix, I can just try call you know call V transpose X some other Y, and this is basically just looking at um, V transpose X since V is invertible. It's just a one to one transformation of X. And so I could just call it y, looking at all the vectors where x has a unit vector and v transpose x. That's this is just some other unit vector. Um, we'll call it y. So v transpose x is just some other unit vector. So we could just call it y and then maximize over unit vectors y. And so what we get is that this capital M here is basically the maximum of these unit vectors of d times y. Now d is a diagonal matrix, 
and on the diagonals of it are the singular values, sigma 1, sigma 2, all the way up to sigma n. It's an n by n matrix, so we'll have n of these singular values. And the norm of d, which is this diagonal matrix times y, is just the square root of the sum of the squares of d times y, which will be sigma 1 times y, 1 squared, plus sigma 2 times y2 squared, etc., plus sigma n times yn squared, right? Because if we just multiply a vector times a diagonal matrix, it just scales the elements of my vector by the diagonal. So sigma 1, y1, sigma 2, y2, etc., sigma n, yn. Then we take those elements, we square them, we sum them up, and we take the square root. That's what the norm is. And so I want to maximize this. What's the maximum value this can ever attain? Well, sigma 1, we have a condition that sigma 1 is bigger than or equal to sigma 2 is bigger than or equal to sigma 3, dot, dot, dot. So by convention, we order these in this way, just purely convention. Um, but that's the convention we use. And so the maximum value would be, should be to set y1 is equal to 1, set the other elements to 0. So y1 is 1, set this thing to 1. It has to be a unit vector, which means all the rest of these have to be zeros. And we're going to get the maximum value is square root of sigma 1 squared is just sigma 1. So m, capital M, is just sigma 1. And we can do a similar proof to show that little m is just sigma n, the smallest singular value. And if my condition number, my condition number of my matrix is just the maximum, so it's typically denoted like this, the maximum singular value, or at sigma 1, divided by the minimum singular value, um, sigma n. And so this relates our condition number back to the singular values. And um, so the condition number is, again, is just is going to be the ratio of these singular values. And that's, a, that's a cute little proof. And it'll come up probably next lecture when we talk about what we call ridge regression. But let's stop talking about linear algebra, because we've been talking about that for a half an hour now. And let's go back to why we care about any of this at all. Why do we care? Recall for regression, um, and maybe we should call it LS regression, least squares regression. If you go back to our lecture, we said, we said that beta hat was x transpose x inverse x transpose y. And this followed because if I uh, set my um, gradient equal to 0, um, What we were basically doing is you look at the derivative of my squared loss. And if, you know, we want to find uh, the minimum value of L, which is my loss or my empirical loss, what do you do when you want to find the minimum? You take the derivative with respect to the variable. In this case, the variable is beta. You want to find the beta that minimizes L. And you set it equal to zero. And if you did that, I made this claim, but I don't think I proved it, that this um, leads to um, a system of equations that is dl d beta equals zero is equivalent to solving the system x transpose x times beta is equal to x transpose times y. So 
place for the gradient zero, which will be the place that minimizes our squared loss, is when you actually take the derivative and you set it equal to zero, what you get is this system of equations to solve. And these are the so-called normal equations, not to be confused with normal distribution, has nothing to do with that. It has to do with, um, so you, but you might see these in the intro stats or at some of the stats course we call the normal equations. Um, and solving these, you know, what we said is, okay, so what you do is you multiply by x transpose x inverse and you get your beta hat would be x transpose x inverse by x transpose y. So that's where beta hat comes from. So here's a system of equations. Let's call this thing A, let's call this thing Z, and let's call that thing, which is just some vector, B. And so what I have here is that the stability of beta hat, my solution to this system of equations, depends on the condition number of a, which in this case is x transpose x. So when I solve a least squares regression problem, this is a 35 minute tour to say, the stability of my least squares regression depends on the condition number of this matrix x transpose x. So when are we going to get kind of an ill-conditioned? So let me write this as a question. In reality, when do uh, we get an, quote, ill-conditioned um, regression problem? I.e., what I mean by that is when is the condition number of x transpose x large. Because if the condition number of x transpose x is large, I could potentially run into some issues. Um, what we had said is that, um, let me just back up here a bit, is that we said previously that beta hat is unique, this is back way back in that regression lecture, if and only if x um, transpose x is invertible. So <clears throat> what we had said is that if x transpose x was not invertible or um, equivalently the rank of our design matrix um, is equal to the number of observations, let's say n, that's equivalent to x transpose x being invertible, um, yeah, um, if, so we had said that that's, that's the previous condition, and we had kind of drawn some pictures, right, where we had said that um, in the kind of unique case, we'd get, you know, this would be my L of beta function. Here is my beta hat. And this black case here is maybe X transpose X is invertible. Okay. And then we had said that if X transpose X was not invertible, my L of beta might be flat. And so we wouldn't have a unique solution because every possible every solution here in some direction would be equivalently. So this is my in the case where x transpose x is invertible, I get this nice parabola. I have a minimum; it's well defined. If x transpose x is not invertible, my my um, design matrix is rank efficient. What we had said is that we basically have a flat a flat loss function here, and there's not going to be a unique beta hat. And so in this case, the first case here, we can now talk about this in condition number. If the condition number of x transpose x is small, we're going to get a well-defined beta hat here. 
in this case, if x transpose of x is not invertible, we said that the condition number is infinite. We have a very, we have an infinitely ill-conditioned problem. We don't even have a unique solution. But the third case, and I think we've already talked about this, is that you can get something that's close to not invertible. Maybe x, maybe the technically x transpose x is invertible, but the condition number is really large. And so I basically get an ill-conditioned system of equations, right? What's going to happen is that this system of equations here that I use to solve beta hat is ill-conditioned. It's very sensitive. And so my m what that means is that if I slightly perturb my data, I have about equivalently good beta hats for a large range of things. Technically, there's a, there's a minimum at, at, at my beta hat value. But the nearby ones are pretty much as good. And the other viewpoint is that the condition number is so large that if my data slightly changes, I'm going to get a really, I'm going to get a slightly different beta hat, or I'm going to get a very different beta hat that, you know, um, so I can get kind of a, a, a kind of very poor behavior where small, you know, round off errors in my, my design matrix might lead to very different solutions. Um, so this is kind of how all this all this plays together. The condition number is kind of a way of measuring how non-invertible. If condition number is infinite, technically not invertible, no unique solution. If it's really small, well, good. Solution can be stable. You can your data, it's kind of stable. But if it's large, we could have issues. And um, we could have things, we could have these kind of situations where basically x transpose x is kind of close to not invertible. <clears throat> so a question I kind of posed up here, and let's now answer this question is in reality, you know, so when do you run into this problem where, where, where you have an ill conditioned problem? So here's an example. Because, well, so let me write two examples. One is that x transpose x is technically not invertible if any of the columns of x are a linear combination of any other. So if we're really unlucky to get a data matrix where one of the columns is some linear combination of another, we um, we would get a non-invertible x transpose x, and we would have a incredibly ill-conditioned problem. That is relatively unlikely to happen exactly, um, because it's relatively unlikely that one of our variables is exactly a linear combination of the others. More likely. Um, is that x transpose x is close to not invertible and that one variable is approximately a linear combination of others. So it's highly correlated. One variable is highly correlated with some linear combination of other. Now that can happen. Um, where you've included things that are really closely related. And um, that can cause issues because it's going to make the estimate of my beta hat really unstable. Um, the exception here is that if the number of variables I have exceeds the number of observations I have, then x transpose x is not invertible. So that's a realistic case we can run into. All you have to do is have measure more, um, more variables than you have observations. For example, um, x is the gene expression, whatever that means, for 
let's say p i don't know we have maybe you know 50000 genes so i measured the gene expression for all 50000 genes of how many people of maybe n is equal to 30 people so this is a situation I deal with a lot in the, in the work I do. It's called the quote, high dimensional case. And basically what your X matrix is, is this short and fat matrix that looks like this. So here my N is 30, so I have 30 rows and my P is maybe 50,000. So I get this really short and fat matrix. And this is a case where X transpose X is at least straight up not invertible, not just not close to being invertible, it has no inverse. And so our beta hat is definitely not unique. If I wanted to regress this, you know, regress some Y, maybe I'm predicting white blood cell count from, you know, gene expression, I would not have a unique solution to do that. I could not solve that problem uniquely. Um, and so the question that we want to just start answering today is how do we deal with this? And we're going to have a couple different strategies. We're going to just briefly go over one today. The first one we're going to talk about today is called variable selection. And the idea is basically to remove variables to better condition our problem. To increase the stability of our solution. We will talk about, so this is called variable selection, we're going to talk about that today. In the coming lectures, um, we will talk about shrinkage, shrinkage estimators, in particular ridge regression and the lasso, which are fancier ways, and we'll talk about how they're related to variable selection. And then the third approach um, we'll talk about is dimensionality reduction. And the example here is going to be PCA regression. And this is actually going to lead into unsupervised analysis. So the second half of the course is going to delineate kind of the first half and the second half. The second half of the course I said is going to be about dimensionality reduction, I'm sorry, it's about unsupervised analysis. The first topic is gonna to be dimensionality reduction, which is, we'll talk about this, it's gonna be an unsupervised technique, but we can actually re relate it back to our regression, the supervised technique, through something we we'll call PCA regression. In any case, we're gonna talk about various selection today. We'll talk about shrinkage after that, next lecture. And then we'll start talking about some unsupervised techniques um, so dimensionality reduction, and we'll pretty much immediately say, and by the way, you can use this in a similar way. And we'll relate that to um, the variable selection and shrinkage um, estimators that we've developed. So let's talk about variable selection. Right, so basically this lecture is about, so let's just do a real quick recap. Right? We talked about this condition number, which tells us how ill-conditioned things are. And we care because it's, if we fit just a least squares regression, which we're talking about, the stability of the solution is related to the condition number of X transpose X, which is related to kind of how unique our solution is and how stable our solution is. And you can either get it kind of uh, practically, if N is less than or equal to P, you can still get situations where it's almost, X transpose X is almost not invertible, but you also get these quote, high dimensional cases where you have a ton of variables and you, you wouldn't actually be able to fit a regression because you wouldn't be able to get a unique solution. So the first way of solving this is variable selection, which is just basically, okay, I have, um, you know, in a high dimensional case or I have covariates that are highly correlated so either X transpose X is not invertible or it's close to not invertible. And the goal here is to pick a subset of important variables. Um, and just use those. And the immediate question is how do we define best 
or how do we define important? Quote, important. Variables. So, um, there are a couple ways we can do this. Today, um, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about variable selection and we're basically going to define a metric of performance um, for the model and, and compare this for different sets of covariance. Um, so the uh, kind of follow-up question is not only how do I define important variables, but how do I define define a good set of variables? Um, because you know you could kind of have have two approaches here. Your first approach might be, you know, individual metrics. So let's say, e.g., we look at a p-value um, for each variable, which maybe tells me how important that variable is, and choose um, variables with smallest p-values. And you could do this with other metrics. If you you know don't want a p-value, you could use beta hats or something. You couple up the metric with the variable, and you choose the smallest, smallest or the best according to that metric. The problem with this is that the performance of one variable uh, might be affected. by inclusion or exclusion of others. So it's, you know, it's not as simple as just uh, in a regression model, this variable adds this much and you, know, you can, can't really separate the importance. You have to really talk about um, metrics of groups of variables because it may be important to include this variable if this other variable is in the model, but it may not be important to include that variable if this other variable isn't in the model, or vice versa. This one may be important if that one's not in the model, but if it, the other one isn't in the model, this one's not important. Yeah, this is, anyways, they can affect each other. So what you really need to do is look at kind of group metrics. Um, let's say metrics for for sets of variables. And um, the idea here is, as I said, we're going to build a model with uh, different groups uh, or collections of variables and use the kind of best performing group. So ideally you would try all different groups of variables and we'll talk about why that's kind of infeasible computationally. But ideally you would just try all different kind of collections of variables and use that kind of use the group of them that 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 performs best. Now we have to be a bit careful here. Um, You can't you you know you can't look at just the training. You can look at test metrics. Um, so you know, let's just say don't look at training metrics um, because training metrics will increase. If um, let's say p, the number of variables increase increases, let's say right. So this is more flexibility um, as p increases. So if p is the number of variables. 
if I increase the number of variables, I increase the flexibility of my model, I'm just always going to get better training metrics, right? So we've talked about this kind of ad nauseum. So you can't just look at the training metrics. So solutions, the modern kind of solution is do a test, you know, or maybe a train validation test split. And so that's maybe solution one. The second solution, because we're talking about just, and that's a good solution kind of generally. The second solution, which is the kind of more classic solution, would be to penalize the metrics, the training metrics, by, the, by P. And so I think it's worth talking about this as a very classic way of solving this problem, is we can just, we can look at the training metrics but we can penalize training metrics by P. So what I mean is that normally if you just look at the training metrics, it would just keep telling you to increase P, keep increasing the number of covariates, keep, keep increasing the number of covariates. Um, what variables include, just include them all because that's going to make my training metrics look better. But um, obviously that's bad. That's, that's overfitting our model. And so the, the modern approach might be just to, to do this train validation test split, but the kind of classic approach here was a very simply just this one variable P I can play with, increase, decrease, right? You can think about it that way. And I could look at my training metrics, but I could say, I'm going to look at a balance between what the training metric is and how many covariates I have. And so um, we can look at some examples here. This is kind of the, let's just say this is the classic approach to solving this problem. And by examples here, you may have heard of adjusted R squared. So R squared is our fit. R squared in the context of regression is typically the training R squared. And you could alternatively define an adjusted R squared. And I'm, I'm not going to go into too much detail over it. It has a certain formula. And generally, right, that the deal with R squared is that higher R squared is better. So if I just optimize the number of covariates to include, based on R squared, I would just keep increasing um, P. I would keep chasing that better and better R squared, because if I add covariates, my R squared will always go up. My training R squared always goes up. So what you could do is you could use adjusted R squared, which has this formula, and um, I'll let you convince yourself that this, that as P increases, um, R squared adjusted will go down, other things equal, right? So as I increase P, it's in the denominator here. You don't have to worry too much about the specific form. As I increase P, it's in the denominator. It will bring down adjusted R squared. and so you get a balance where this R squared here, this part will go up as it increase covariates, but my denominator here will pull it down. And so you won't, so if you say optimize, you know, the number of covariates include based on this adjusted R squared, you're not gonna necessarily just always increase, um, increase your adjusted, uh, increase the number of covariates. There's other kind of what we'll call RSS based, um, metrics or adjustments of of RSS. All right, so RSS the smaller is better. So let's say smaller RSS is better. And again, if we were just to chase RSS, the training RSS here, it would always tell us to, inc to include more covariates. So what we can do is we can look at let's say um, there's something called Mallow's C sub P, and again, I don't expect you to memorize these formulas. I'm gonna write it out. It's good to see once in your life. But it's basically RSS plus some penalty that increases at, uh, as I increase P, the number of covariates. The sigma hat squared is an estimate of um, the error variance. 
you know, the kind of typical regression model. And so basically the idea is that this adjusted R squared, um, I'm sorry, this, this mal CP is like RSS, but it adds on this penalty term. So we call this thing a penalty. That if I increase P too much, it's going to start tacking stuff on. So um, as I decrease, I'm sorry, as I increase P, RSS, the training RSS generally goes down, but this term goes up. So you're going to get a balance there. And um, you're not, mal CP will eventually tell you to stop including things. Whereas if you just look at RSS straight up, it can always tell you to include more um, covariance. And there's other, there's other um, things very related to this. Um, I, I'm just going to write these out. Um, I guess you should see these names once in your life. Um, AIC. So these are all kind of really classic ways of solving this problem. Nowadays, probably you just do train test split. AIC, Akaika's information criterion. And, but again, it's this kind of a uh, RSS based approach. And I'll write out the formula. You don't have to memorize it, um, but it has a similar kind of form where it has this penalty term. So it's like RSS, whatever out front, but we have this penalty for large P, if I increase P too much, this penalty is going to start dominating. And so um, I'm not going to minimize the AIC, right? As I increase P, RSS goes down, but eventually this second term is going to start, it will go up. And so there's a balancing there. And there's something, and I'll, I'll stop here, um, or I will, I will just talk about how we use this, but um, the last one I want to mention is called BIC. Um, it's called Bayesian Information Criterion. And there are whole books on each of these, so I'm doing this real short shrift, um, but we're not going to get into it too much here. It's good to see the names. They're all, for our, our sake, um, very similar. It's just taking the RSS, doing some other stuff to it, but again, um, it has this penalty term that increases with P. So P will decrease RSS, but it'll increase this penalty term. And so you won't just, it won't, if you, if you choose the number of covariates by say minimizing BIC or AIC or MALO CP, you're not going to just in, keep increasing P forever. So this is, um, this is the, the classic way of doing this for, um, for, regression models, because regression models were studied extensively during the, the 20th century, there's all of this, like, you know, volumes and volumes of books about these different approaches. Nowadays, you know, because the hyper, the parameters and so-called hyperparameters of these algorithms are very complicated, people tend to just do a test train split, which is totally legitimate. Um, but this is another way of thinking about it, where it can do some kind of penalty. And you could even do a test train split and optimize with these um, in, in um, as part of kind of a, some kind of fancy cross validation. So these metrics are um, allow us to um, give us some kind of metrics. These BIC, AIC, these metrics allow us um, things to shoot for. So these, so just going back to what we're talking about here, right? What I said is that we're going to get a metric for a set of variables. And, and we're going to look at different collection of variables and use the best performing group. And our metric, either you can do it based off some kind of test trade split, or you can use this kind of classic penalized version of RSS or R squared. So you might choose the number of covariates by looking at, or choose the set of covariates by looking at different sets of variables, different sets of covariates, and say, choosing the one with the smallest mal CP, or choosing the one with the smallest AIC, or choosing the one with the smallest BC. Uh, BIC. Um, and you can do this systematically. And this will be this, the last thing we say before we sign off for the day. Um, search. There are different ways of kind of systematically going through um, different collections of variables. Um, and I'll just talk about two. Forward selection. And this is a very classic thing you'd see in your regression book. And the idea is you add 
variables one at a time to regression model. Um, and you add the variable that, um, which variable you add, you add the variable that, um, uh, say, gives best either increase or decrease in metric. So either you increase in, in adjusted R squared or decrease in you know AIC. So you add the variable that moves you in the right direction for the metric. So you start with zero variables and you say, okay, which variable would increase my uh, would decrease my AIC by the most? Add that in. Step two. Okay, which um, which of, which second variable do I add? If I have that first one, which is the second one I add that increases my say adjusted R squared by the most. Okay, you add that one, then you say, okay, I'm going to add a third variable. Which of these third variables increases my adjusted R squared by the most? And so what you get is um, maybe a plot like this. So maybe here is my R squared adjusted and you'd have p and you would add uh, you know maybe p is one two three four five six and um, you add your first variable maybe it gives you an adjusted r squared there you add your second variable that increases your adjusted r squared as most as possible maybe it puts you there you add a third one maybe it puts you there but maybe if you add a fourth one because your adjusted r squared will penalize you for adding too many covariates you may actually start to see a decrease. And so what you would say is I'm going to choose, um, choose say three covariates. And you choose those three covariates that are chosen through this forward stepwise selection where I add one, then I add one, then I add one. So you add one that increases, you know, adjusted R squared the most. And you add the second one that will increase that adjusted R squared by the most. You add the third one that just increases it by the most. Um, you know, as you go from three to four, you're adding the one that would actually decrease it the least, right? Because actually your adjusted R squared will start to decrease and so forth. That's called forward forward selection. And um, alternatively, you can do backward um, stepwise selection. So I, this probably should be stepwise. And backward is is what you do. So forward, you start with start with zero, with no covariates, and you add one at a time. You add one, you add another, and you kind of go through and you add the best one you can at each step. Backward, you start with all covariates, and you remove one at a time. Um, removing uh, the variable that hurts model metric the least. So you start with all our variables and you'd say, okay, if I, which variable can I remove that, that hurts my adjusted R squared the least? Remove that. Okay, now I'm gonna remove another one. Which one hurts my adjusted R squared the least? Remove that one. So you do this kind of, Similar thing, it's basically the reverse of forward stepwise. You start with all of them, you remove one at a time. Um, and um, and you can, you, you know, you'll get a similar graph to this one, um, and you will then kind of choose the optimal value of covariance. Ideally, obviously we test all subsets of variables, and you would calculate some metric and you have some plot over all possible subsets. Um, this is not computationally possible or feasible for large P, right? As P becomes large, testing all subsets computationally is just impossibly hard. And so we don't actually do that. Um, and so this is why people use these kind of what are called greedy heuristics, 
and write that heuristic, where they're not necessarily going to find the best subset. They're not testing all subsets. They're testing some sequence, greedily adding, in this case, greedily adding variables one at a time, or in the case of backward subset selection, greedily removing one at a time. Um, so they're not going to test all possible combinations of all variables. You could do it. But for if you know if you have 500 variables, um, you have 500 choose one plus 500 choose two plus 500 choose three plus 500 choose four, etc. That many um, regressions to run, and not tractable computationally. Okay, so let we'll, we'll stop there, and um, we just started today talking about um, about stability of a regression fit and kind of variable selection. So we talked about condition number, which is a, a really useful concept that, that kind of measures the stability of our of a beta hat for a regression fit. And um, we talked about how, we talked about kind of the first, the first approach of how we might deal with this, with, with ill condition problem. Basically this, throw out variables until it's better conditioned and choose the best set. And the way we choose the best is basically you calculate a metric for a set of variables. And um, the classic way is to do the, these kind of penalized of like RSS or penalized R squared and you use some kind of systematic search to test some collection of different sets of variables and choose one that works well. Um, and next time I'll start talking about fancier ways of doing this. Uh, of doing this kind of um, dealing with ill-conditioned fits.